Conservative Book Club members, thank you for listening to our weekly author interview series. I'm Chris Malagisi, Editor-in-Chief of the Conservative Book Club, now with over 750,000 members nationwide. Today we have a special exclusive in-office author interview with Raheem Kassam, author of the new book, No Go Zones, How Sharia Law is Coming to a Neighborhood Near You, published by Regnery Publishing with a special forward from Nigel Farage. I've known Rahim for years and can attest to his good work, and for those who have not heard of Rahim, he's the editor-in-chief of Breitbart London and a host of Breitbart News Daily on Sirius XM, Station 125 in the U.S. He has written for many publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Daily Caller, and The Telegraph, and was a senior advisor to Brexit leader Nigel Farage when he was leader of the U.K. Independence Party, or known as UKIP. He's a senior distinguished fellow at the Gatestone Institute and a fellow at the Middle East Forum and has previously worked for think tanks including the Henry Jackson Society and the Bow Group. Born in London to Tan uh, Tanzanian immigrant parents of Gujarati descent, Kassam was raised in Ismaili sect of Shia Islam and has become a subject expert in regards to radical Islam and has reported extensively on the topic. And the book is getting noticed by several experts in the field including Robert Spencer who says that no-Go Zones is a unique look at the phenomenon that is growing under the noses of our politicians and law enforcement officials who are too busy pursuing so-called outreach to Muslim communities to notice. And even our friend Noni Darwish says, Thank you, Rahim Kassam, for alerting the West of this purely Islamic phenomenon of rejection that will inevitably lead to a bloody confrontation between the Islamic and Western way of life. Rahim, congratulations on your new book, No Go Zones, and thank you for joining us today at the Conservative Book Club. Thank you. The pleasure's all mine. Well, let's first start off, start off by asking the most obvious question. What is a no-go zone, and what are the problems with them? There are several different types of no-go zones, as I, as I found over my trip uh, around the world, um, to Brussels, to Sweden, to the United Kingdom, to right here in the United States, where these things are just starting to gestate within your communities. Um, and it was very disturbing to, to see the, the primary indicators, the first foundational indicators of this stuff uh, popping up here, because I've been a long-standing visitor to the United States, a long-standing friend um, of, of, of Americans, and I, I've, I've admired and loved your identity and culture for so very long uh, that to see these sorts of things popping up in neighborhoods in America was truly disturbing. There are different types of no-go zones. Um, there are some areas where young ladies in skirts or perhaps in strap, strapless dresses or, or strappy dresses uh, just wouldn't go for fear of being harassed, intimidated, attacked, shouted at, spit on, so on and so forth. Uh, there are some areas in European cities and suburbs especially where the police won't go, or at least they won't go to policemen, what we call bobbies in England, uh, to an area. Uh, they will go in, in vans, usually two vans uh, of, of six police each, uh, because they are concerned and they know from historical and uh, anecdotal evidence from their colleagues that if they go there in small numbers they will be set upon by the local, uh, local population. There are some areas where the buses won't stop at certain times of the year or after certain incidents have occurred. Um, there are areas that see regular rioting, firebombing of cars, the overturning of vehicles on the streets. Um, so, so it depends on where you are in the world. They, they manifest themselves all slightly differently. But if there is one thing that unites them all, it is that the, the migrant population in those areas are primarily, if not wholly, Islamic. Can you talk about Sharia law? I think a lot of people have heard of this term, uh, but they don't really know the details why it's so bad. Where We hear on the news, Sharia law is bad, but why is it so bad? Well, Sharia law as a phrase is actually a tautology. The word Sharia means law, but, but Sharia law has become the, the term of use, and that's why we use it on the, on the book jacket. It's, it's sort of not familiar enough to people that you can just say Sharia. Um, so, and so Sharia law has become the turn of phrase. But... Uh, what it is, is it's not just about whether or not your hands and feet are chopped off if you're found to be uh, an apostate from Islam like myself, or you're found to be in, in you know, deviation with the Hadiths, or you don't uh, want to wear the hijab or anything like that. Um, Sharia is, a, is an all-encompassing way of life. 
Um, strict adherence to Sharia will demand that you sleep on only your right hand side because that's the way Muhammad apparently slept. Um, adherence of Sharia law will tell you that disputes must be settled not in the courts of the nation in which you live, but in their own Sharia courts or Sharia councils as we see across the United Kingdom at the moment, local community disputes, including those that involve non-Muslims, are being settled in Sharia councils in 2017 in the United Kingdom. And that is incredibly nefarious and insidious, if you, if you ask me. Um, Sharia is also, therefore, a political system. Um, it, it, it proscribes uh, you know, laws and punishments uh, upon which people are expected to live, and don't let people tell you that Sharia is only supposed to be implemented in Muslim-majority countries, which is kind of the escape clause that Islamist apologists use. Actually, what we've seen is once Muslim migrant populations reach a certain level, they start to demand that they are allowed to practice and live by the Sharia in and of themselves, in and of their own communities. And those communities turn into almost holy Muslim communities, and many of them become no-go zones, in effect, uh, places where somebody like yourself, that looks like yourself, Christopher, if you won't mind me saying, may get set upon or beaten up um, just because of the way you look. You're walking down the wrong street. I was recently in East London. Um, it was actually after I'd completed the book. I took another walk around a neighbourhood called Tower Hamlets, and it was actually on Election Day in the United Kingdom. And a group of five clearly Muslim boys approached me because I was wearing a suit jacket, a shirt, and tidy jeans and nice shoes, or at least I like to think nice shoes, um, and said to me, get out of this neighborhood if you're not voting Labour. Now, they know nothing about politics, but what they know is that the Labour Party encourages their dependency, their welfareism, and represents uh, and allows for the representation of radical Islam in government. So... You're set, you intimate in the book that, and you even list names of cities and towns, can you give us an idea of just how, how bad is this in the U.S. and tell us where exactly you see the biggest activity of, of these no-go zones? Well, so luckily you haven't quite reached a point where you can't walk down the street in somewhere like Dearborn in Michigan or Hamtramck in Michigan, or in pockets of Brooklyn, um, or in areas such as uh, uh, Minneapolis, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but they are swiftly moving there. Uh, in Hamtramck, for instance, I mean, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. It's a 2.1 square mile town that used to be mostly populated by Polish-American uh, immigrants uh, that now has 17 mosques. Uh, that is an uppermost estimate of, 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 of locals. Um, the lower estimate that I heard was only 14. So either way you look at it, uh, that's almost a mosque every other street corner. This is a city whereby the local Muslim population were pre playing the the azan, the Islamic call to prayer, out on the streets through speakers from their mosques. I mean, when you get to a position like that, how can you say you're in America anymore? And the city council is now a majority Muslim city council, so of course when people complain, their complaints are falling on deaf ears. They're falling on ears that, that don't not just not care, uh, they actually celebrate the fact that they're able to do this, that they've taken over the city. And, and that's one of the shocking things you learn about in your book, and it's just how this is actually being allowed to happen. And you, again, you list some great things, well, great things that... Horrible things. <laughs> horrible things yeah. that allow this to take place. One of the things is how American taxpayers are even in some ways helping to fund these areas. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, the uh, migrant communities, when they, when they first come over, are, are, you know, they have a... A predilection for dependency, um, and some would say that's a leg up, and and there is a there is a case to be made uh, when you take it out of the purview of looking at individual migrant communities, uh, but when you do look into each and every single community individually, you will notice that that Muslim communities tend not to then take that uh, money and opportunity and and and. Uh, promote themselves out of that dependency, they will actually stay quite happily dependent. And it means that they, a lot of them don't have to work. 
um, the men in, in, in Molenbeek in Brussels and, and in Husby and Rinkeby in Sweden will happily sit in cafes all day long uh, drinking uh, uh, what they call te nana, mint tea, um, and just, just sitting there shooting the breeze all day long. Uh, they have no inclination to, to go out and get jobs and be net contributors to the societies in which they live, and it's happening here too. Um, the, the, the thing you're lucky that you have in this country, that, that actually European nations, especially predominantly socialist nations in Europe, uh, they don't have, is a work ethic. Uh, and they have societal pressures. You have societal pressures in this country that lend towards people actually having to get up and do a job and contribute. Um, in a lot of European countries now, that is that is being completely abandoned, if not attacked as a notion. Why should people have to work? You know, why should people have to pay their way? Um, and so migrant communities in, in, in the United Kingdom and, and across Europe are settling into this idea that we will just leech off the taxpayer teat as long as you allow us to do so. I mean, it, it's amazing to think how the this is going on and even being propagated by um, our local law enforcement officials that allow this stuff to happen. I, I'm curious to get your thoughts on where does political correctness play in all this? Do you think this is a big reason why these, you don't have these law enforcement officials police these areas and um, have town council, city councils go and enforce local statutes and things like that. Um, I'd be curious to get your opinion on that. Well, in my estimation, political correctness isn't the uh, you know isn't the prime mover behind this. Uh, it isn't the the rationale behind what's going on, but it's the cudgel which with which they beat uh, uh, critics. Um, you know, to, to, to say that Islam is somehow a race, for instance, and therefore label people racist uh, for being critical of, of, of fundamentalist or literalist uh, Islamic doctrines is, is, a, is a, a, a total farce and a nonsense uh, for those, especially those like me who have lived it um, and who have, who have breathed it their entire lives. Can you talk, can you talk, don't mean to interrupt yeah. you, but um, you have an interesting story. Can you tell us a little bit your story and how you became passionate about this issue? Well, I I was a practicing Muslim, albeit on the more liberal Shia Ismaili side of things, um, but I was rubbing up alongside a lot of fundamentalist Sunnis, especially at university, and I went to the University of Westminster, which has been multiple times referred to, not least by me, but also across the British press, as a hotbed of radical Islamism or radicalism. Um, the Muhammad M. Wazi was his name was two years below me at the University of Westminster. For those that don't know who Muhammad Mwazi was, he went on to become Jihadi John, the famous uh, Islamic State uh, beheader-in-chief or executioner, um, the, the, the first Jihadi John, now deceased. Um, and I, I could see, when I was at university, still being a practicing Muslim, again, albeit in, in a slightly li more liberal sect, for instance, at, at my mosque, uh, women would not be required to wear a hijab or a niqab. Men and women sat next to each other the entire time. But actually that allowed me an even better insight because you will imagine how, how jarring it was for me being at university with more strict fundamentalist Sunnis who were telling me that I didn't qualify as a real Muslim because of those things. And I remember being guilted as a young man being guilted by these guys after a seminar one day and they said to me you must come to an Islamic society meeting this was a group of Muslim students that used to meet regularly and they happen you know you have Islamic society student societies all across this country all across my country too um, and so uh, at a time of day uh, that I would usually set off to the pub uh, or the student oh. union uh, I found myself gravitating towards uh, this building on Little Titchfield Street um, in the centre of London, uh, right outside Regent's Park Tube Station, for anybody that, uh, that, anybody that, know that knows the area. Um, and as I was walking up the steps of that building, ready to go into the Islamic Society meeting, uh, my friend Richard at the time was trying to convince me to go to the pub with him instead. And I said, no, Richard, look, I'll, I, will, I will meet you at the pub in an hour's time. I promise these guys I'll go into this meeting. As I was walking up the steps... These guys came out and they said, you don't want to go in there. They're showing videos of 9-11 and clapping and cheering. And uh, it's not like I knew it at the time, but looking back on it, and I did an about face and I shouted down the street, Richard, I'm coming to the pub. Um, that was one of the most formative moments in, 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 in my life. That was, I suppose, the thing that made me realize in the, uh, in the longer term that not only should I do, not only you know, could I do something about this? I should do something about this. I must do something about this. I, I maybe I must whistleblow about it from the inside out, and that's exactly what I did. 
I graduated in 2007 from university, and in 2009 I set up a counter-extremism pressure group that looked at radical Islamists preaching on university campuses. Just one last question. Mm. What do you hope readers will take away after reading your book, and what actions can they take to help remedy all this? Well, it depends where you're reading from, but I suppose the vast majority of this listenership will be in the United States. For, for, for those in, in, in Europe, I will be succinct. Um, you need to know what your governments are hiding from you, and you need to act upon those things. Stop, stop voting for these people. Stop believing their lies. Um, from a, 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 an American perspective, you are on the precipice now. Of, of, of losing your nation, of losing your identity, of losing your culture, of losing your constitution, quite frankly, because if Sharia law is allowed to be uh, propagated, where, how, in however small communities it is, that is a fundamental undermining of the United States Constitution. That is, that is the backbone, the vertebrae of your, of your, of your world. Um, and, and so you cannot allow that to happen. My, my, my thing about this for Americans, it's, it's a warning. There, you don't need to get aggressive about the response to the things that are going on in your communities, uh, you know, literally. But you need to get aggressive uh, through the ballot box. You need to get aggressive politically. You need to you need to make sure. If there's one thing that I think every person that buys this book should do is actually buy a second copy of the book and send it to their uh, congressman, to their senator, to their governor, and ensure that they read it and hound them until they read it and and hound them until they uh, uh, promise to make sure that nothing like that is going on in their neighbourhoods, because people out there are being ignored. There are interviews in this book with people in Michigan especially who have been talking about this whistleblowing about the Diobandi mosques these fundamentalist mosques popping up in their neighborhoods and their lawmakers don't want to do anything about it they're scared of the CNNs of the world and the MSNBCs of the world uh, uh, taking aim at them you know taking fire at them for taking a stand on these things um, so America my warning to you on uh, in this book your takeaway must be that this is not something that's coming down the line in 10 years time this is here now what are you going to do about it well, that's an important message and you heard not only buy a copy of it but buy another copy and send it to a, a friend and I'm nothing look, if not a great salesperson <laughs> Rahim, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. We wish you all the best of luck with your book, No Go Zones. CBC members, make sure to check out conservativebookclub.com to learn more about Rahim Kassam and his new book. Thank you again, Rahim, for 